Well, good evening. It's time to start our class tonight. And uh, before we start, we'll have a word of prayer. If you'll bow with me, we'll uh, have that prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we've had. We thank you for all the blessings that we have in this life. As we go through this material tonight, we ask you to help us to realize that what we have comes from you and that you expect us to use it in a wise manner. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this congregation and all the members here. We thank you for each other, how we can watch over each other and watch out for each other. And we ask you to help us to all get to heaven when we die. Dear Heavenly Father, mostly we thank you for your son Jesus who came and died that we might have life. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Last week, we uh, talked about some of this, uh, some material. Some of it, you may think it's a little repetitive, and I guess on some level it is. But it's a little more detailed tonight, and it kind of heads in different directions. Uh, when I was really young, I don't remember what grade, but I don't know, probably third or fourth grade, fifth grade maybe. Uh, it was cool to have a leather string about this long. And at the end of it was a weight. And, and I had three sisters, so you could swing it around and hit them with it and that kind of thing, you know. That wasn't what you were supposed to do with it. But this leather, a piece of leather, uh, wasn't a string, but a piece of leather, thin strip of leather, with that ball on the end of it, the key was uh, you could flip it in a certain way and tie a knot around that, that leather. And you just flip it like that. And I worked and worked and worked and worked on that and finally got it. And it's kind of like riding a bicycle. Once you did it once, it was really easy to do it after that little bit of practice and it worked. If I get on with the class material and we get to the last parable that I have prepared for tonight, it's a lot like that leather piece, of, that leather toy. I have struggled with it all my life and I think I finally have a handle on it. So I thank Sam for asking me to teach this material because it helped me with that uh, <clears throat> with that uh, parable. Anyway, the memory verse tonight, but godliness, of course we're studying godliness, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. <clears throat> Money and wealth are neither godly or ungodly. What is money? What is, what is money? Okay, we can exchange it for something. What is it? It's a tool. Money is a tool. We can buy things. We can pay people for things. We can, uh, when they... Um, uh, mow our grass or whatever, we can pay them with it. It is an exchange of, of wealth, essentially. It has no character. You can spend it on good stuff. You can spend it on bad stuff. But the money itself has no character. Unrighteous mammon, in Luke 16, 9, simply means not righteous. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwelling. Anybody want to take a shot at that? And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. 
You know what I think of when I read this verse? First thing that hits me is that poor little Jewish boy that was a young man that was feeding the pigs and he was so hungry he wanted to eat the pods that he was feeding the hogs the prodigal son and we all know that story he spent all his wealth and he had many friends but when that money ran out what happened did he have all those friends no not anymore they just all kind of drifted away. That's what that re verse reminds me of. And we'll talk about it in a little while. But as you read that verse, can anyone but Jesus save us? Can anyone but Jesus save us? No. If we make our friends happy, if we make our friends really happy, can they save us? No. Can our money save us? No. The only way I can understand and justify verse 9 is to think Jesus is using sarcasm or irony or... We'll talk about this a little later. The use of our money is a good test of the lordship of Christ. Money belongs to God, not us. Let us use our resources wisely. Let us pick things that are, are, that are important to the good Lord. Money can be used for good or evil. Let us use ours for good. Money has a lot of power, and don't ever think it doesn't. Money has a lot of power. Let us use it carefully and thoughtfully. We must use our material goods in a way that will foster faith and obedience. <clears throat> Luke 12, 33 says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What we treasure, what we consider treasure, that's where our thoughts and efforts will go. Uh, Genesis 24, 34 through 35 says, So he said, I am Abram's, Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. Think about, as we're reading some of these verses to come, how do the following passages show that prosperity in and of itself is not evil? What does the Bible teach us about a rich man? It is easier for what? To go through what than a rich man to enter heaven? A camel go through the eye of a needle than a rich man go to heaven. But there are a lot of rich people in the Bible. Godly people in the Bible. So what's the difference between them and some others? And we'll talk about those in just a minute. Abraham was blessed. Abraham was extremely wealthy. And we talked about this, I think, in an earlier class. And I don't remember the exact number, but he had 380, something like that, 380 warriors from his own house that went to him to get Lot back when those kings stole Lot. So he had an army of roughly 400 men along with all this other stuff. So Abraham was quite, quite wealthy. <clears throat> Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that map is really poor. And I apologize for that. It looked good on the computer, as they say. But it doesn't look good in here. If you know where the Tigris and Euphrates River flow down, where, where Abraham came from, Ur of the Chaldees, 
Mesopotamia is the land that, that kind of slides like this along the Tigris and Euphrates River where the Garden of Eden, Eden used to be. And uh, that area down there by the Suez Canal, all of that, is where Uz was. And uh, Job lived there. Anyway, there was this man that was named Job that lived there. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Here was a rich, rich, rich man. We talked about Elon Musk. This was one of the Elon Musks of that time period. And he was a godly man. We all know the story of Job. After Satan tried Job, after the whole book, uh, 42.12 says, And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, or Dove, and the name of the second one Keziah, Cassia, uh, Cassia Aromatic Spice, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk, Horn of Eye Paint. I thought that was interesting. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. How unusual was that? That didn't happen ever, ever, ever. The daughters were just kind of a possession. But Job gave his daughters an inheritance like his sons, which was very unusual at the time. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. A righteous man, beyond words, very, very wealthy. <clears throat> How do the following passages show that prosperity is not evil? There were rich Christians that we read about. Uh, Joseph called Barnabas, Acts 4, 36 through 37. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cy uh, Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and bought, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Someone else did that with a little bit of a twist. Who was that? Do you remember? Ananias and Sapphira. How was their outcome different from Barnabas's? Say again? They held back some of the money, but they told the apostles that was all of it. And the Holy Spirit struck them dead. Anyway, that's not the story of Barnabas. Barnabas sold his field and gave the money to the apostles to help with the uh, charitable contributions that the people in Jerusalem needed. Acts 9.36, now there was a man in Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity, and when, when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Many acts of charity. We know Dorcas had uh, money or she wouldn't have been able to be charitable with it. Of course, she was raised from the dead. Uh, Cornelius. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all of his household. 
gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. At that point in time, Cornelius was not a Christian, but he was a godly man, and later he would become a Christian when uh, he was taught. <clears throat> David? Well, right. We're going to talk about a self-made man in just a minute. David, <laughs> David says he doesn't believe in the Bible there's ever exa an example of a godly man who considers himself a self-made man. And David, you're probably right. I don't know of one. But we're going to talk about one that considered himself a self-made man, okay? <clears throat> uh, Sergius Paulus was a proconsul, which is a governor of a province in ancient Rome, and he wouldn't have gotten that position had he not been a wealthy man. But he came to Barnabas and Paul and wanted to find out about Christianity. Uh, Lydia in Acts 16, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Now she's talking to Jesus and his entourage, so she must have had a fair-sized house to put them all up. So Lydia was probably a wealthy woman, obviously a seller of purple. Purple was a uh, special fabric back then. Nason of Cyprus in Acts 21, after these days we got ready and went to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. <clears throat> Again, this man had a, a home large enough to cover whoever was with him at the time. Other examples of rich Christians, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, Philemon, our beloved, our beloved fellow worker, and um, Apia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier in the church, that is in your house. So they had a house there big enough for the group to congregate in. <clears throat> we can ask ourselves, and we talked about this I think last week, but the most misquoted verse in the Bible probably, or one of them, what is the root of all kinds of evil? One word. Money, right? Wrong. It's not money. Money is not the answer to that question. What is the root of all kinds of evil? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It is the love of money that causes this issue. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money. Money has no character. It doesn't do anything. If we sit it on a table, it will sit there until until somebody comes along and picks it up and takes it away. Money has no character. It will sit there until somebody moves it. That's the English version of the Bible. I'll put it again with the New American Standard Bible. What is the root of all kinds of evil? But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And this is the sad part about it. What is stronger to some people than the desire to be faithful? To be faithful. To look to God, to look to Jesus, and to remain faithful. To remain godly. It's this desire to be rich. Desire to be wealthy. Desire to have more. And that longing has cost many, many, many people eternally. I threw this in here because it was an interesting discussion I saw in one of the, uh, one of the commentators. And this is the kind of stuff, the reason I put it in here is sometimes people will have arguments that you don't really consider. I hadn't thought of this ever. I never heard of it until I started reading this. Turns out it's kind of a big deal. But I had never heard it personally. You know, Abraham had, I don't know, 3,000 camels or something like that. Job had, I don't know, six or 7,000. I can't remember the number. But they had camels. And uh, some biblical texts, such as Genesis 12 and 24, claim that Abraham owned camels. Yet archaeological research shows that camels were not domesticated in the land of Canaan until the 10th century B.C., about a 1,000 years after the time of Abraham. This seems to suggest that camels in these biblical stories are anachronistic. And anachronistic just means belonging to another time than what we're reading about. If somebody reads that, what can they say about the scriptures? Abraham had camels. No, he didn't. They weren't even there. He couldn't have had. The scriptures must be wrong. The Bible is a lie. The Bible is a, a lie. Or is it? Or is it? You know, we get all this archaeological evidence and it comes in pieces and pieces. And many, many times, over and over and over, we get pieces of evidence that just proves the Bible is true. And this is one of those things. There's a guy named Chavalas. He explores the history of camel uh, domestication in, in his biblical views column, Did Abraham Ride a Camel? And there's just an article this smart guy wrote. It was published in November, December 2018 issue of Biblical Archaeology Review. Although he agrees that camel domestication likely did not take place in Canaan until about the 10th century B.C., he notes that Abraham's place of origin was not Canaan but Mesopotamia. Thus, to ascertain whether Abraham's camels were anachronistic, we need to ask, when were camels first domesticated in Mesopotamia? Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees, where camels were domesticated much, much earlier than in Canaan. And, of course, that's where he came from. He could very well have brought them with him. Although domesticated camels may not have been widespread in Mesopotamia in the second millennium, these pieces of evidence show that by the second millennium, there were at least some domesticated camels. Thus, camel domestication had taken place in Mesopotamia by the time of Abraham. Accordingly, Chavalas argues that camels in the stories of Abraham in Genesis are not anachronistic. He believes they were there, just like I believe they were there. If the Bible says Abraham had camels, I believe he had camels. <clears throat> now, I don't know why in the world anyone would study camel domestication, but for all the people interested in camels, you can read more about this in his biblical views column. <clears throat> We're going to look at some ungodly attitudes toward money as seen in the following rich people. There are rich people in the Bible, 
that were not living right. Nehemiah 5, 1 through 6, we had a great lesson on Nehemiah uh, not long ago. <clears throat> Put yourself in these people's shoes. Are most people wealthy today? Are most people rich today? I mean, I could say everyone in America is rich. You know, I could say that. I mean, Solomon in all of his glory couldn't boil water in a Pyrex glass in a minute. He didn't have a microwave. He didn't have a camera. There are incredible things that we have today that Solomon never dreamed of, and he was the wisest man on earth. So I could say everyone in America is rich, but is that really true? Depends on who you ask. Okay, that's probably good. But kind of put yourself in these person's shoes. They were, these were people that were living in Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah. And what's Nehemiah famous for? Rebuilding the wall, having the wall rebuilt. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain so that we may eat and live. And there were others who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses so that we might get grain because of the famine. There also were those who said, We have borrowed money from the king, for the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. And who are they borrowing this money from? They're Jewish brothers and sisters. And the Jewish brothers and sisters were charging them interest. Verse 5. And now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their, their children. Yet behold, they are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters are forced into bondage already. And we are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. Then I was very angry when I heard their outcry and, and these words. That's Nehemiah speaking. <coughs> he was upset, and he told the other Jews, the Jews in uh, Jerusalem at the time, to give it back and stop doing that. And you know what they did? No. They gave it back and they stopped doing it. Isn't that an incredible story? One guy stood up for what was right, and what happened? Kind of reminds me of Jonah and Nineveh. And Jonah just hated that about Nineveh. He went and preached to them and said, Repent or God's going to destroy y'all. And what did they do? They repented them. They repented of their uh, evil ways. And God didn't destroy them. And it really made Jonah mad. <laughs> Nehemiah asked these people to stop doing this. And they stopped. <clears throat> Amos 6, 1, 2, and 1, 2 through 6. Woe to those who are carefree in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountains of Samaria, the dignitaries of the foremost of nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge around on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the fattened cattle who improvise to the sound of the harp. Time out. <clears throat> and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacred bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of, of oils, yet they have not grieved over the collapse of Joseph. <coughs> Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the reverie of those who lounge around will come to an end. These were wealthy people that cared nothing 
about the God of the heavens and were just living their life. <clears throat> Here's a rich person, a really sad story. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. At this point in his life, what did he care more about? The Lord or his money? Obviously his money. <clears throat> Luke 12, 15 through 21. But he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when, is, when one is affluent does his life consist of, of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began thinking to himself, saying, what shall, what did you say, David? What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will store all my grains and, and my goods there, and I will say to myself, you have many go goods stored up, for many years to come, relax, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Did this guy consider him a self-made man? Yes, sir. I did. This is mine, and I got so much, I got to build bigger barns so I can put my stuff in it. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is demanded of you. And as for all that you have prepared, who will own it now? Such is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich in relation to God. I said this the other day, and it hit me right before I said it, to say it. <clears throat> I asked the class, what happens when you die? And I promise you, the more I've thought about it since I said that in class, the more I think it's true. What happens when you die is four or five people enter your house with a bunch of garbage bags and they put your stuff in it and they carry it out to the street. Or Goodwill or some donation station. That's it. We worry about our boats and our cars and our rings and our jewelry and our whatever, our stocks and bonds. We worry about all that stuff and somebody else is going to own it. And likely it's somebody who doesn't care about what, about what you had. Treasures in heaven. That's where it's at. David? Right. <clears throat> and y'all have a pretty good idea who I'm talking about when I'm talking about cleaning out houses and stuff like that. And I mean no disrespect to the people in my family that we have done that with recently. That's not. I just see it happen to them who are good people. Now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen enjoying himself <clears throat> in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. 
and longing to be fed from the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Not only that, the dogs who were coming and licking his sores. Now it happened that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's arms. Now, if you don't find comfort in that, you're missing something. I think that's the coolest thing in the world. This poor man's laying at the gate, and he dies. I can just imagine, I don't know if this is what happens. I, I have no clue. But that verse says the angels took him, carried him away, to Abraham's arms, Abraham's bosom and other translations. I don't know, I don't understand all of that. But what I do understand about it is angels came and brought him to Abraham. Now I can just see people I know who died and in a manner that we have no way of seeing, of no way of knowing, an angel coming and saying, it's time. <clears throat> I wish I knew more about that verse, but I don't. And the rich man also died, and guess what? I don't see any angels carrying him away to Abraham. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades he raised his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his arms. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between you, between us and you, a great chasm has been set, so that those who want to go from here to you will not be able, nor will any people cross over from there to us. <clears throat> James verse 5, Come now, you rich people, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded, and their corrosion will serve as a testimony against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up for your, tre you have stored up for your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mo uh, mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. This is kind of the way it happens. You know, rich, ungodly people believe the world owes them something, and it owes them more and more. And you go do work for them, and they don't necessarily have to pay you. I'm talking about ungodly people. What ungodly attitudes toward money may be seen in poor people? 1 Timothy 6, 9, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. What happens to those who have such desires? <clears throat> The acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor, the pursuit of death. In Jeremiah 22, woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upstairs rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages and does not, and does not give him his wages. The one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor producing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. What I wanted to get to was the shrewd um, servant, the shrewd steward. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll just start with that next week. We'll start with that next week.
Thank y'all. I appreciate your attendance very, very much. Well, good evening, everyone. 
it's time for us to get started. It's good to see everyone here. We've got visitors. We've got folks uh, in from school. And it's just good to see everybody's face here. The, uh, it, it's very encouraging to all of us. It's great to be together, and I'm, I'm just happy to see everyone here. If you're visiting with us and you're not a member of our church, we want you to know that you're our special guest tonight. And we hope that you've uh, enjoyed the Bible class. If you have any questions about anything that we've talked about, please let us know. We would love to talk to you about that. Uh, we're going to sing uh, 893, Let Us Know Jehovah. And the invitation song, if you want to mark it, it's going to be number 968, Sanctuary. I think we've sung this a couple of times. It's, it's a pretty easy one, so... No so let us know Jehovah come let us pray so see everybody tonight. Tonight I'd like to talk about a phrase that Lawrence Kelly used in his lessons with us and it kind of stuck in my mind as things tend to do as porous as it is. This phrase had to do with a, a certain event that happened and it begins in Nehemiah chapter 2 and we start to see a scenario unfold, and I'll give a little bit of that background. There had been some Jews in Jerusalem, and they had come back to the capital of Susa. And they talk to Nehemiah, and they give him a report of the disrepair of the city and how things had progressed and the condition of the people and the fact that the temple at this point had been built, but it was left unprotected, and the wall was completely broken down, and it had an impact on Nehemiah. It had an impact on his countenance, on his character, on his face, on his demeanor. And the king took note of that, and in taking note, he asked Nehemiah, who happens to be his cupbearer. Now, I don't think we can appreciate this relationship for what it is because in that day and in that time a king if you displeased him that's it you're done it's over head gone game over so he was fearful for himself but he gave the answer whenever he gave that answer he phrased the question back to Nehemiah and it was a very simple question his question was what would you request? At that, point, at that point, in that verse, it says, and Nehemiah prayed to the Lord God of heaven. Now, do you remember what term Lawrence used to describe that prayer? He called it an arrow prayer. An arrow prayer. Now, 
for those of you who don't know this about me, I have a particular interest in archery. So I'm going to draw out that analogy a little bit more and make fun of one of our brethren in the process. There are many similarities to what Lawrence talked about, but the, the point that Lawrence made is he had a brief second, a brevity of moment, a brief statement, a laser-like statement made in between two sentences before he gave an answer, not something that was planned out. It was completely focused, and he did it to address God and to address his need. And he derived great strength from it. What other similarities do I see in this analogy of archery? Well, the first one is arrows. How many arrows do you and I keep in our prayer quiver? Well, if you look in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, it says to pray without ceasing. How many arrows is that? And do you use them? What we must infer from that scripture is our prayer arrow quiver is kind of like Legolas the elf on Lord of the Rings. It never runs out and you keep using them okay second thing is with that prayer arrow can you hit the mark can you hit what you're aiming at there's a accomplishment in archery terms Whenever you shoot an arrow and you drive another arrow through that arrow, it's called a Robin Hood. And it can be done by most people, except some. Picking it steep. Can you hit your mark? Well, it could be argued that if you don't know what your mark is, it's impossible, impossible to hit that mark. In first, uh, I'm sorry, lost my place. In second, that's in second Timothy two and fifteen. It says, "Study to show thyself approved, a workman who rightly divides the word of truth." Know the truth. Know what the mark is. Finally, the question, can you consistently hit the mark? Or a better wording might be, what is it that helps you consistently hit your mark with your prayer arrow? Another point of improvement. Practice in a word practice. How often do you engage in this activity? Archery, like golf, like baseball, like anything else, is muscle memory. Doing the same thing the same way over and over and over again. And I think it's easy to make the point that prayer has to be a part of my life, a part of the fabric of my life. It's part of who I am. Christ demonstrated his prayer life over and over and over again, both publicly and privately. And it's something that I should look to do as well. In James 4, verses 2 and 4, James tells us that you don't have because you don't ask. And you don't receive because you ask amiss. What's the solution? I think we've already read one of the solutions. First Thessalonians. How often do you pray? Always. 
You pray always, and you use that avenue of prayer. And he goes on to answer some of that for us, how to hit our mark in that process. How do you pray? You pray humbly. You submit yourself to God in verse 7, and you play, pray humbly, found in James verse 4 and verse 10. Finally, prayer is a powerful tool, a powerful tool that can assist us in all of our needs. That's, again, found in James, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 18. So the final point that I'd like to make and leave with you is this. Prayer teaches us something else, something very, very important to our spiritual life. It consistently and continually reminds me of who I am and my perspective for God and my utter dependence on his grace, on the Lord's grace and the grace that is extended through Christ his son and the sacrifice that was made for all mankind so that's the talk tonight but the question to you and to those that are streaming with us is do you have need of that have you established that covenant relationship by being baptized into his death contacting his blood being raised anew to walk in a newness of life? Or do you need the prayers of the congregation? If you have any need, we ask you to come as the invitation and sing. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving Just a couple of announcements before we're dismissed in prayer by Brother Chris Robbins. In terms of prayer needs, prayer requests, let's remember Wanda Hunt, who remains in the medical center in room 440, Marilyn Sanders, who continues in rehab at Baptist Hospital. She's in room 544. Donna Cooper continues in rehab at Bon V in room 223. Bubba Wakefield remains in Herman Memorial Hospital, and he's in Houston. Larry, Larry Moore remains at the medical center here in Port Arthur. Michael Duvall, son of James and Judy Duvall, is still having very serious difficulties with his health and his cancer, so please remember him, as well as Kathy Crandall, who is having difficulty in her recovery from COVID. And additional announcements, Group 5 will meet this Sunday. That will be at Steve and Amy Savant's home. And there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. There will be a special lesson series that has to do with personal evangelism with Chuck Bartlett. That will be June 15th through the 17th. There will be two sessions each evening. That will begin at 6.30. There will be an intermission. And there will be a second lesson at 7.30. And there is a meal list in the foyer if you would like to sign up for that. The Southside Lectures have, we, uh, there is a bus being provided through the work of the individuals of the congregation, 
uh, for the lecture and the song service afterwards. That is on Thursday, June 23rd, and there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for anyone who would like to be on that trip. BBS will be June, July 18th through the 22nd. Please sign up for that if you're willing to teach or assist in that regard. To the deacons, there will be a meeting at 5 p.m. this coming Sunday. I have one other thing that I need to announce, and that is a couple's wedding shower, and I'm going to just read through the the card here, and then I'm going to give it to Seleka, and she's going to make sure it gets posted in the back. But this is a, sh a wedding shower for Garrett Elizondo and Nicole Guerrero, and that will be Sunday, June 12th, at, uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. It will be at the home of Jathan and Belinda, 2821 10th Street, and that is in Port Natchez, and I'll put this in the back. Um, please join us for a gift card couple's wedding shower. So if you have questions or need more details, get with any of the ladies of the congregation. I'm sure they can direct you in the way that you need to go in that regard. Please remember our Sunday morning song, uh, our Sunday morning Bible classes that will be at 9 and then Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. And I think I got everything. If there's nothing else, Chris, would you dismiss us, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings that you've given to us. We're so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity that we've had this evening to open your word, to study it, to learn the truth, Lord, and to sing praises unto you, to pray together. We pray that what we've done this evening has been pleasing unto, your, unto you and edifying to each other. Lord, there are many who could not be with us, many who are ill, Larry Moore, Wanda Hunt, Marilyn Sanders, Donna Cooper, Michael DeVoe, Miss Kathy Crandall. Lord, we ask you please be with each and every one of them. Help them who are recovering. Help those who are going through the, the height of their illness, Lord. If it be your will, bring them all back to a fair measure of health, Lord. Be with those attending to them. Lord, there are many still who are suffering from loss of loved ones who are still getting their lives back into some sort of normalcy. Lord, be with them. Be with those, Lord, who are traveling this summer or this weekend or this, this week, that they could be safe and be returned safely as well. Lord, we're so mindful of all the chaos that is going around us, but Lord, Jesus Christ is, is truly what our goal should be set on, following his example. And as we read our Bibles, Lord, and as we go out into the world around us, we, we pray that you would help us to be a worthy example of Jesus Christ to those around us, that we can bring others to you through him, and that we can share the truth with those around us, Lord. Please guide, guard, and direct us, keep us safe, and all these things we pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.